Good evening. I'm Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, and I'm delighted to welcome you here to tonight's lecture, which is part of the Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. And this, in fact, is our penultimate lecture for uh, the summer 2021 season. We would like to thank all of you uh, attending this evening for your support of this lecture. For those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York was founded in 1785 by 22 artisans. Today, our 236 year old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life of the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition free mechanics institute, the General Society Library, the John M. Mossman Lock Museum, and our nearly 200 year old lecture series of which, of course, this lecture is part of. At the conclusion of tonight's talk, there'll be a short 10 to 15 minute Q&A. Please feel free to submit type questions throughout the lecture uh, through the Q&A section. And of course, at the conclusion of the talk. And we would ask that you use the Q&A section rather than raise your hand. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of welcoming Rachel Bernstein and Shai Green. Rachel Bernstein is the co-author of Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives, a Pictorial History of Working People in New York City. This wonderful book was first published in 2000 and was republished and updated on its 20th anniversary last year. I am so pleased to be able to welcome this evening, Rachel Bernstein to discuss the exceptional lives and images featured in this book and to introduce our special guest, Shai Green. I also want to mention that this outstanding book is available through the NYU Press website, nyupress.org. Rachel, a very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Victoria. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, just urge everybody to visit the General Society. It's an extraordinary organization and, and a facet of that culture of solidarity that we're gonna talk about tonight. So go check out the Locke Museum um, and think about this library that's centuries old. Um, the plan for the evening is that I'm going to introduce Shai Green briefly um, and then talk for about a half an hour about the book um, and some of the extraordinary people and images within it. And then I'm going to, and Shai is going to help me with that by reading some of the oral histories. And then I'm going to give Shai about 10 minutes to talk about her own 21st century uh, extraordinary path um, in New York City construction. So uh, following that, Karen will moderate a Q&A. And I have something for you all to think about uh, for the Q&A, which is that we are already working on the 21st century version of this project, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives. And Shai Green is a good candidate for being featured in the next book. Um, that's one of the reasons she's here tonight. But we're really looking for all of you who are with us to make suggestions. Um, about what should be, who we should contact and what should be there. Um, what's the garment industry of the 21st century for New York City newcomers? What kind of jobs are out there? Um, what's the uh, chorus for the 21st century? What kind of cultural activities are people um, using? So keep that in mind for the Q&A. Let me just tell you briefly about Shai Green, a construction worker, an extremely active member of Laborers Local 79, an outspoken advocate for safety and training in the construction industry. She was on the Brian Lair radio show to raise awareness about that issue 
and the tragic number of construction workers who died on the job, mostly on non-union jobs. Um, she's a mentor and teacher, and as of this month, the executive director of Pathways to Apprenticeship, in all an extraordinary person. Um, you'll hear more when we reach the 21st century part of this program, um, but I'm so happy that you're here, Shai. Thank you. So welcome. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to advance my screen. There we go. Um, so Ordinary People, this is the cover of the original book that was published in the year 2000. And the project Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives started more than a decade before that. Um, it was first, I think, a survey of records about workers, a documentation project, an oral history project, a series of workshops, and an exhibit, all before it became a book. Um, my extraordinary co-author, the late Deborah Bernhardt, initiated those efforts as part of the Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives at NYU. She always insisted on the full name. Um, she wanted Robert F. Wagner to have his middle initial and Deborah E. Bernhardt to have hers. Uh, we met in 1984 when my public history teaching often led me to the archives. And she, we shared a belief in the usefulness of history, the importance of documenting workers in New York City, and the power of ordinary people in their extraordinary lives. So the oral history excerpts you're going to hear tonight and the photos you'll see tonight, and there are more in the book, um, are really the tip of the iceberg. For each photo and each quote, there was an extraordinary number of other opportunities. Um, and the way we came up with them was collaboration, which is a strategy for every stage of this project. Um, and I just want to give a couple of details. Uh, there was, um, as I mentioned, a series of outreach meetings and workshops and calls to people to bring in records and photographs and ideas about where there would be records hidden in basements and other places. Um, at the end of a lot of that, we published a series of recommendations in 1994, the title of which was Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives. And next came an exhibit designed to make the contributions of labor are part of the centennial celebration of New York City's unification when the five boroughs became New York City in 1898. 100 years later, in 1998, there was this huge celebration. Um, we wanted to be sure labor wasn't left out. And that's an exhibit. Um, as that exhibit traveled, we ended up working with NYU Press on a book which was, uh, again, only the tip of the iceberg. And again, collaboration was the process. And I just want to thank, I know there are some people here who worked on it um, and on various stages of the documentation project and the exhibit and the book and with Deborah and with me over the decade. So welcome. And um, I consider that whole process a a really great example of the culture of solidarity that's at the core of this book. Um, and it's a theme we'll keep returning to. So the first section of the book um, is called Building the City, and it tries to give a sense of the people who built the city. Um, this is a photo by Charles Rivers. It's 1929. Um, it's extraordinary. We actually know that it's a photo of an iron worker by an iron worker. We know his name. He, Charlie Rivers was a machinist, a labor organizer, a civil rights activist, and an extraordinary amateur photographer um, who was born in, uh, his name when he was born was Constantinos Caperanos, Caperanaros. He was born in Greece. Um, he changed his name to Charlie Rivers for a reason that may not surprise you. He wanted to imply a connection to the Mohawk um, tribe with their reputation for fearless and swift work on sky, skyscrapers. He took, he worked on both the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building and took some extraordinary photos. Um, 
Another photo, this one, as you'll recognize, it's from the cover of the first edition, uh, is another, um, and it's unusual in that it's really hard to find a place where you can see a face and also see a recognizable uh, city landmark. Um, so this is um, by an unknown photographer, um, but we do know the bridge painter's name. We know he's on the Queensboro 59th Street Bridge. His name is Philip Keating. He was the son of Irish immigrants. We also know something um, tragic. He fell to his death while painting another bridge seven years later after a fellow bridge painter snapped the shot. So the original version of the book was dedicated to him and to the workers who died on a job in New York City. And sadly, that's, that's an issue today. Um, and I think Shai is going to talk more about it. Uh, safety and construction is, is an important issue today. Uh, jumping back to 1914, just because no one can resist this photo. Um, and it's another group of bridge painters um, artfully posing on the Brooklyn Bridge. And uh, when we first published the book, we didn't know the name of the photographer. It came from the New York City Archives, Department of Public Works. And it was one of many thousands of photos taken to document the work that city workers did. Subsequently, um, researchers at the archives determined that Eugene de Salignac um, was the photographer and he worked in the Department of Public Works for decades and took a whole series of really revealing shots of New York City um, building, tra building trades mostly at work. Uh, so um, this was probably done uh, after a group of people were paid to repaint the Brooklyn Bridge and he posed them on the stretchers for the Brooklyn Bridge. And a lot of people think it looks like a musical, a staff. I'm not sure what it would sound like, but if anybody's a musician and can figure that out, let us know. Uh, this is a photo from the municipal archives as well. And, uh, and it shows us something about New York City in the early 20th century. This is a group of African-American workers laying sewer pipe in Queens. Um, it was very unusual for black workers to get jobs, municipal jobs at this time. Um, so it's an important piece of documentation. It's a bit of a mystery. It's labeled capital R, capital C, Pipers, R, C, Pipers. Uh, not only do we not know the photographer, uh, but we don't know what R, C, Pipers means. And we're still looking for somebody to contribute that. Um, this, uh, I'm going to just move along here. This is a, again, a photo that I think speaks, that I wish I had an oral history to go with, but it, it evokes an issue in the constructs, construction trades that's been there uh, for many decades um, about civil rights. Uh, construction Industry has always been a ladder for newcomers to the city, but um, the building trades union have won wages for skilled workers, but and fought to improve safety conditions. Um, but they have a checkered record in terms of opening up membership to women and to minorities. Uh, so a lot more to be said on that, but um, and the change didn't come easy. This is a from the civil disobedience, um, again, trying to help the construction trades integrate and make room for minorities and women. Um, this is Cynthia Long. It's a little bit of a fuzzy photo. Um, and she's one of the women who pioneered in the construction trades um, and in the long and very much ongoing effort to open building trades to women. She's one of the first women to gain electricity gain admission to the electricians union and she was interviewed by Deborah Bernhardt in 1980. And a bit of that oral history is featured in the book. Shai Green, another pioneering woman, is going to read an excerpt from Cynthia's oral history. Shai? I 
I had worked in offices. I had done these traditional female roles and I didn't like them for all the, what I considered garbage that you had to put up with. It was extremely low paying because you'd be spending your money to buy clothing to look attractive for the office. So I came to the conclusion that with a skilled trade, I would have mobility. I would also have a skill that could command a good price. I was informed by the women in the apprenticeship project that the electrician's union was opening up in June of 1978. We organized a sleep out on the streets of Flushing outside the joint industry board for six nights and five days just to get the applications. We were part of the first hundred people on that line, so we attracted a lot of media attention, as well as attention from electricians who would come by kind of checking on us. Most of the electricians would say to us, this is men's work, heavy work. And we would say, I don't think it would be that much heavier than carrying a sleepy five or seven year old child or carrying wet laundry or carrying two full bags of groceries up a six floor walk up. We have done these things. It's very hard for them to conceptualize, but so, uh, somebody wanting to do this work. So I turn it around and say, well, sorry. So I turn it around and say, well, why do you wanna do this work? And they say, because it pays well. I say, precisely, that's what it's about. Thank you. Um, we're, we're gonna, thank you, Shai. We're gonna come back to your experience in the construction industry in a short while. Um, and I just want to mention, I, I heard that Jane Latour might be here this evening. I can't see a list, so I don't know. But I want to mention that Cynthia is featured in her book called Sisters in the Brotherhood. Um, and there's a, a little exhibit about that on the Labor Arts website. And it's, uh, it's an important book um, and a part of your history, Shai. Uh, so the second section of the book asks the question, what jobs would somebody arriving in New York City find? Um, this city, New York City, at different times in the 20th century was the nation's largest and most varied workplace, um, its largest manufacturing center, its busiest port, the point of entry for the largest number of immigrants, the most densely settled city in the world. Over the course of a century, the work available gradually changed from skill-based to knowledge-based. Um, and the question of is asked in the book, what are the jobs that come out after over the course of the century? And the question we'll ask at the end is, what are the jobs that we have now in the 21st century? The busiest port in the world saw a huge range of conditions on the docks. Um, and a lot of organizing. Uh, the docks, like the construction trades, were places where newcomers could get the dirtiest work. Um, we picked this photo of um, unloading bananas um, because we had this striking quote from an oral history with Frank Barbaro, who some of you may remember. At the time, he was a New York State Supreme Court judge and also a former longshoreman. And Shai's gonna read a quote from Frank Barbaro. I never worked the banana docks, even in the 1950s. Banana ships were unloaded in the most primitive, backbreaking manner, literally. It was one of the few docks where Black longshoremen were allowed to find work. Thanks. Um, the stories, uh, we, we're not giving you the whole of any of these oral histories, the stories of the spiders in the bananas um, bring home the, the myriad dangers of work like this. Not only is it backbreaking, but there's a, a lot else going on there. Um, this photo from 1918 is one of a different kind of manufacturing, uh, cigar workers in lower Manhattan. And we actually know the name of the man in the center, David Isaac, Jacobowitz um, and his daughter, Shirley Small, and her husband, Mel, um, saved this photo and somehow connected with Deborah and the Wagner Labor Archives at one of our events, and we were able to use the, the cigar worker factory photo. Um, the cigar industry was one place where Cuban and Puerto Rican immigrant workers were open were welcome. And as you can see from this photo, it's one of the fairly rare places where men and women worked side by side. 
So as a youth, in, um, before he came to this country, David Jacobowitz studied to be a rabbi. Um, he, that was in Budapest. And this photograph was taken shortly after he arrived in this country by an itinerant photographer who would make a print and then sell it to anybody in the shop who could uh, afford the steep price. So we're so glad he's, he bought it and his family saved it. Um, garment work was maybe the single largest industry in New York City during the middle of the century. And organizing among garment workers was key to what um, to the laws that we have today and to and really shape the city. Uh, I'm skipping over things here so quickly. So forgive me, but that's what you have to do when you're trying to cover a whole century. Uh, this image is from the Italian Dressmakers Union. Um, and it's their 15th anniversary. And for much of the 20th century, again, immigrants, usually originally Eastern European, Italian and Jewish, um, arrived. Many of them arrived with tailoring skills. Um, and later, uh, Asian and Hispanic workers found work in the garment industry. And I just love this image. Uh, another place where people could find jobs is uh, in office work. We ended up finding a typing class um, as to represent the young women training to be office workers. And moving right along past some oral histories I really wish I could share um, is a photo, another photo where we actually know some names and some details, a photo of Irish waitresses in the kitchen of Stoker's in Manhattan. Um, it's amazing. We actually know the names of two of these workers, Joan Benin and Kathleen Moriarty. And we know where county in Ireland they're from, um, County Kerry and County Cork. So entry level jobs and hotel and restaurant workers are still today um, important jobs for newcomers and the effort to unionize them continues. Some of them are unionized, a lot of them are not. As you all know, and we've been made even more acutely aware during the pandemic when suddenly essential workers included restaurant workers. Um, we don't have a quote from either of the women uh, in this photograph, but we do have a quote from Loretta Selegia Postek, a cafeteria worker. She's talking about the same time period, the middle of the last century, um, and Again, some of the issues that still remain today. Shai, would you read Loretta's quote? It was a bitch. They could do whatever they wanted to, to you. They could tell you to come in and then, and then there you go. They could tell you to go home. I became a carver. I had to stand up on a box because I was so short. You'd carve these big roasts and they paid me much less than a man carver. That was one thing that burnt my fanny. And we had more women in that industry because they paid them less. If they didn't like the way that you looked or they didn't, or you didn't go to bed with the boss, out. If you didn't let somebody fill you up, out. During the depression, you go for a job. They'd say with pleasure, whatever, whatever it was, $10 a week, interviewer. And without pleasure, you didn't get the job, period. This happens more to office workers that with or without pleasure than it did to unskilled workers. And in factories, it happened. A lot of girls were scared. They were frightened. They were afraid to talk back to the boss. They were afraid. That was one thing I remember saying. If you join the union, you don't have to be afraid. You're not alone because there are other people with you. Thank you. Um... Again, I think it's an issue that is ongoing and something that the labor movement has struggled to be um, supportive of. Um, there have been women active in this issue for such a long time, and there's, there's still a lot to do, as we all know. Um, this photo is from another key sector of our economy. Um, it's a New York City teacher in the classroom. Um, 
and it's by one of the extraordinary labor photographers who documented the activities of ordinary people um, and workers and whose collection is in the Wagner Labor Archives. Um, and there is a feature on labor arts with five labor photographers whose photos are in the labor archives and it includes uh, a wealth of Sam Reese photos. So I urge you all to, to take a look. And creating a culture of solidarity is a very complicated um, process, but a key to understanding how New York became New York. Um, what do we mean by that? Um, a culture of solidarity isn't one massive working class that has an understanding that everybody agrees on. Um, it's something, however, that is even more important, I think, in this country, uh, in the 20th century and in the 20th, 21st century. And I would say it's a culture where many people go beyond the American dream of individualism and see hope in working toward the welfare of the many. And they do that in so many different ways. It's a culture that takes different forms, has moments of strength, has times of setback, has serious divisions and acrimony, um, but it has helped us have laws, not always followed, not enough, but laws that make us a society that endeavors to care for its ill and elderly, educate its young, welcome newcomers, create democracy in the workplace. Um, when the culture of solidarity is strong, when working New Yorkers are united by shared experiences and values and assumptions, um, just a little bit united, never entirely, we find that coalitions and collaborations between workers and artists are at their height. So in the moments over the century when the organizations of working people have been strong, their artists working with them have also been strong. So uh, this is a union label poster. It's over a hundred years old. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, we're still working on encouraging working people to buy things that are made by goods that are made by workers who aren't mistreated. So uh, there's probably a current version of this um, and we'll have to find it. This photo is from the International Lady Garment Workers Union Archives at uh, the Keel Center at Cornell. And it's looking out onto the street. Um, many of you know the story of the garment workers strike in 1909, which was followed closely by a cloak makers strike of even greater um, numbers uh, the following year. So both uh, really engendered a, a sense of solidarity and um, made a lot of changes in the working conditions in these factories. One of the factories where change didn't occur was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, factory. And it's there on March 25th, 1911, that there is a huge fire which takes us to the next level in terms of society-wide, city-wide, and ultimately nationwide response to the terrible working conditions um, and agreement that we need laws to protect working people in factories. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the story of the fire, that fire escapes were locked to prevent theft. Um, but it really galvanized an extraordinary movement of people um, to make changes that uh, first happened in New York and ultimately spread to the rest of the country. Uh, switching gears, just to make the point that it's not all labor organizing that tells the story of working people. This is a flyer. Um, welcoming Emma Goldman out of prison and uh, advertising a birth control meeting. And although birth control eventually became a movement of its own in the early years and during this period, the 
socialists and radical union organizers were a big part of the birth control movement and the way that it became uh, carried forward. So this too is from the labor archives. And it's another one of those questions, birth control and reproductive rights and the treatment of women that the labor movement has been intermittently very good about, um, but maybe always needing to be pushed. This uh, is a photo of an eviction. Um, communists and socialists and radical labor organizers stopped evictions during the depression um, by massing outside the house where it was happening um, and by organizing massive demonstrations and in all cases demanding government relief programs. And I'm sure you all know those programs included social security and unemployment insurance, which we are the beneficiaries of today. This is Union Square, um, which for 150 years has been the site for the exercise of free speech and assembly, particularly among workers and immigrants. This is a photo by another extraordinary labor photographer named John Albach, um, who has this, you know, has captured this moment with the white marcher, the guys in white costumes in between the uh, sweep of the uh, observers on either side. Uh, this is the 1937 May Day Parade. Um, and Albach was a Hungarian immigrant who owned a tailor's shop uh, and pursued photography along with being a tailor, um, documenting city life as well as activism and Labor Day parades. Uh, Victoria Dengel, the executive director of the General Society, was telling us about growing up going to Labor Day parades. So I'm sure there are others in the audience who have uh, memories of that. This is, uh, these are organizers from the National Maritime Union, uh, immigrant workers on ships were also treated very poorly and the organizers actually brought fresh water and that was a huge benefit um, to the sailors on the ships um, and helped helped with the process of organizing. Um, and uh, not to be repetitive, but then we have a series of oral histories and photos about the National Maritime Union on the Labor Arts website, which I would urge you to take a look at. Uh, skipping right ahead to the question of breaking the color bar. Um, there was a color bar in almost every industry and the process of establishing civil rights over the course of the century was long and agonizingly difficult. Um, this photo is from Gimbel's, it's the eighth floor and uh, I just love the way it has captured this woman and her customer. Um, we have a quote that's not from Gimbel's but it's from Macy's. And uh, again, Shai is gonna read a quote from another one of those extraordinary people whose oral histories are in the Wagner Labor Archives collection. Um, many of them done by Deborah Bernhardt, as well as other people. Uh, this one's from William Atkinson, one of the first four Blacks to break the color bar in sales positions at Macy's with the help of his union, the retail, wholesale, and department store workers. Shai? The places where Blacks put work at Macy's was in the food department as cooks, the receiving department, and the elevator department. And that was all. No selling positions. After my service in World War II, I looked around all of New York to find a job and I couldn't. I didn't want to be an elevator operator. Finally, I went back with my monkey suit on and my ruptured duck, that's his military uniform and honorable discharge. I had, a dis I had discharge papers right under my arm. I put my papers on her desk. She says, oh, Mr. Atkinson, we're so happy to have you back and we know you'd like back your old job. I said, look, 
I fought a war for democracy. I was promised a better world. Now I want a better job. She says, well, what would you like? Now, I knew what the jobs were and what the salaries were. The highest paying job at, at that time was furniture as a salesman. So I said, furniture. She says, oh no, you have to have selling experience. I said, uh-huh, next one, rugs. She says, oh, that's the same thing. I said, radios? She said, radios? No, because you see, you have to have experience. That's what I was waiting for. I said, now Ms. Hyde, be my guest. Turn over my discharge and look at my rating. Radio man, first class, three and a half years experience. And she said, well, there are no openings right now. Thank you. He, uh, as I mentioned, he ends up getting a job in sales at Macy's. Um, and it, it remained difficult for minorities to get jo those jobs for many years after that. But uh, it's a really important part of the story. So I um, want to mention a couple of things. Um, I want to just return to Deborah uh, for a minute to say that uh, the power of art and the power of history were the twin inspirations for the founding of labor arts, which is one of the projects that Deborah somehow managed to fit in before her life was cut short in 2001. Um, and as I mentioned, a number of these themes have been expanded on in the book and in the, on the labor arts website in different exhibits. Um, so we always talked about what would the next volume look like. Um, well, we talked about two things. One, making a paperback version, which we finally have done. I'm thrilled about that to make it more accessible to um, labor education classes and union members uh, than the original hardback. Uh, and also, to to make to make a collection of oral histories and photographs and documents for the 21st century New York City working people. So that's what we want to focus on for this evening. And I want to first go back uh, with a quote that I like like to use. Um, yeah, some of you, have, a lot of you, have heard it before. But it, uh, it's a quote, and the title is, What Does Labor Want? Um, and I think it, it gives us the sense of the breadth of the issue we're dealing with. What does labor want? We want more schoolhouses and less jails, more books and less arsenals, more learning and less vice, more constant work and less crime, more leisure and less greed, more justice and less revenge. In fact, more of the opportunities to cultivate our better natures. Uh, that is from 1893. And I have to say, I feel like it is still um, relevant today. Samuel Gompers, the founder of the American Federation of Labor is the person that we draw that quote from. I would like now to just say, let me just check. Ah. Um, in terms of talking about the 21st century questions, this photo of Randall's Island a baseball game is part of a culture of solidarity that included a focus not just on the workplace, but on people's lives and workers getting together off, off the job in order to understand each other and to build um, the ability to work together to improve conditions on the job. So one of my questions for our discussion is what would the 21st century version of baseball on Randall's Island be? Um, and uh, oops. Not going to go there yet. I wanted to do that. And I also wanted to mention that the cover of the new edition of the paperback edition of the book with called Men at Lunch with the guys on the beam um, 
is meant to catch the eye of people in a bookstore, um, not necessarily those of you in this audience, but people in a bookstore who might not pick up a book about the perspectives of working people. Um, so it's iron workers again, it's men high above Manhattan in 1932, uh, building 30 Rock at Rockefeller Center. Um, and something that I just wanna say before we turn to Shai is that one estimate has it that construction casualties at that time amounted to one dead laborer for every 10 floors. Um, occupational fatalities were horrifyingly common, um, so common that an iron workers were known to say, we don't die, we are killed. Um, that has changed, um, but, but not enough. Um, and with that sobering thought, I wanna change to some, I wanna talk, let Shai talk a little bit about her own path into the construction trades, which is very, very inspiring, and some of the issues that she is uh, working on. Shai Green. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you uh, for allowing me to attend. Um, so I'll get into my story. Um, I started off my career at a non-union plumbing company as an office manager. I was making $14 an hour, bringing home about $450 a week, traveling from New Jersey to Staten Island, uh, which really takes a chunk out of an already small salary. Growing up with six brothers and being raised by a single father and my naturally broad shoulders, it didn't take me long to realize being behind a desk just wasn't where I felt I could really find my footing. However, I got into construction for one reason. I was desperate. I was 25 years old and had two children. I was struggling to support them once their father unexpectedly was incarcerated. Not to mention, I also had a criminal record that haunted me since the age of 19. Construction is an industry that I found to be forgiving, though it is also a dangerous industry that requires training, though you don't need experience to start. Coming in, not necessarily understanding just how dangerous a construction site can be, I can only be thankful that my pathway into this industry was through a union apprenticeship, specifically Local 79 Mason Tenders Training Fund. Before I actually made it onto a construction site, I participated in a mandatory three-week training. Once I hit the field, I had acquired over 10 safety training certifications. And by the time I completed my 4,000 hour apprenticeship training, I had over 30 safety training certifications that included CPR, hazard communication, respiratory protection, uh, silico awareness and confined space training. These types of trainings are something that similar workers in this industry at the time this book was written were not afforded. So again, I can only be thankful for the change uh, and the workers before me who fought for these changes. In the last decade, my industry has also become much more inclusive to minorities, including women, immigrants, and black and brown workers. Due to the inclusion, I have been able to become a part of the upper middle class on my own individual salary. I've become a mentor, an instructor, and an activist in the last seven years since joining this industry. Last year, September 2020, I challenged myself to take on a full-time position as a labor liaison for my local, while still working construction in the field. I did this because I knew it was my calling to assist others who shared similar backgrounds, but at heart, I am a laborer, so leaving the field was not something I was interested in doing. It's been a tiring 10 months, but in the, but in the end, it paid off tremendously. Today, I am the executive director of a nonprofit organization by the name of Pathways to Apprenticeship, the organization I first became only a volunteer of back when I first joined the industry, starting off as a mentor to, to other minority workers coming into this industry. Pathways to Apprenticeship is an organization uh, specifically focused on re-entry uh, justice-involved individuals. Uh, we run a class um, of about 25, uh, four to six times a year where we focus on justice involved individuals or um, underprivileged communities. Uh, we bring them in for training. We specify, of course, the importance of safety because that is my thing. 
uh, and we prepare them for an industry where we were not always uh, welcome into. And to be quite frankly honest, uh, we are not 100% welcome into now, but we are here uh, and we make sure that when we send people, they are prepared, not only for the safety aspect of it, but just for the culture of the industry. Thank you. Um, for so impressive. Uh, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to you getting old enough to uh, for us to do an oral history with it with you but in the in the uh in the interim um i'd like to open it up for questions i think uh and karen oh, uh rachel and shy thank you uh both so much that was really wonderful what a terrific partnership uh you made so thank you um and Rachel, before I ask Victoria if there's anything she wants to comment at this stage, I have to apologize because in my excitement of introducing you and mentioning the book, I did not read out your bio. So do accept my apologies for that. And I'm just going to quickly uh, say that now so we have some more context. Uh, Rachel Bernstein researches and teaches NYC working class history. She directs labor arts, as, as, as Rachel has mentioned a nonprofit using art images and events to bring a broad audience to this often overlooked history. She taught in the graduate program in public history at NYU for 25 years and continues to work on public history projects with NYU's Tamman Library, Robert F. Wagner Labor Archive and at Brooklyn College's Graduate Center for Worker Education. So thank you. thank you and my apologies for doing reading in an unconventional time. Uh, Victoria, would you like to say anything before we open up for questions? Oh, you are muted, Victoria. So I just wanted to hold up the cover of the book as we speak. And, you know, in looking at the title, Rachel, not that I'm telling you to retitle it, but I, I just think the construction industry I guess I'm partial again, growing up as the daughter of a local 14 operating engineer, I'm going to say extraordinary people, extraordinary lives, because <laughs> I'm that partial. Yeah. Here, here. <laughs> Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get right into the questions and have our thank you later, but uh, Shai, thank you for your uh, point of view and telling us your story and you've uh, certainly come a long way fast to that position of executive director. So congratulations to you. And uh, looking forward to meeting you in person. And Rachel, thank you again. Eight, as our audience might not know, but Rachel spoke uh, eight years ago. So we're just only too happy to welcome her back. And thank you. And I also want to thank, you know, I know she's not with us, but Deborah Bernhardt for her work on this, you know, God rest her soul. I mean, this is, was a champion project to bring to store the lives to light of these incredible people that built our city. So, and for which I'm eternally grateful for. So, and so away we go with those questions and thank you. Right, well, the first question and perhaps, um, you know, uh, this is, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I wish that any of us would know the answer to this, but this is from Susan. And she's pondering the number of crane accidents that we find, especially on the buildings on West 57th. Um, as regards health and safety, is there anything that either of you or you are aware of, particularly you, Shai, obviously working in the industry, which I mean, this is a great cause of concern yeah. for workers. So um, unfortunately, I can't speak specifically to crane, um, crane, um, issues. Uh, however, I can speak to the safety concern. Uh, in the last, I'm going to say two and a half to three years now, there's been about somewhere between 40 and 44 deaths. Uh, what I can tell you is that of that 40 to 45, um, over 90% of those deaths were non-union deaths. Um, and that's because you, there's no training in non-union. There's no training that's required. Um, and the uh, contractors and employers try their best to keep as much money as possible to themselves, which is where they shortcut the training. Um, so I believe the number was 39 uh, the last time that I checked. 
of those deaths were non-union workers. Right. Well, I think that, ex that explains a lot. Is there anything you'd want to add, Rachel? Just that it's an ongoing struggle. Um, and there's uh, a day where the New York Central Labor Council and workers come together to talk about worker safety and commemorate the number of people who died on the job in New York City. Um, and also at the Triangle Fire commemoration every year on March 25th down, well, this year it was virtual, but every other year it's down, the building is still standing and worker safety and particularly the number of deaths on construction jobs is a big uh, topic, <coughs> sorry, a big topic of discussion. And it's it also, something we need to work on. Yeah, and it also comes down whether union or non-union to, to the, and Shai, uh, Shai could speak to this, but it comes down to the discipline of the individual, whether that's union or non-union and observing every safety detail and it says something about um, your real, it's, it's, it's what you must adapt. It is, everyone wants to go home at night and that, it, you know, and you have to be looking to the left, looking to the right, and it has to be frowned upon if somebody's not tying themselves on or skipping a step, because it will, it, it, it's, it can happen to the best of the best and, uh, and the personal responsibility. And there's pride in, in doing things the correct way. So yeah, uh, Victoria, the problem with that is when you are working on a non-union site, sometimes it literally comes down to um, looking to your left and your right can be the reason that you are literally thrown off the site. There is no protection for those workers. Um, and, and a lot of those workers who are exploited um, by the system, you know, they come out of prison and they have these parole restrictions and requirements and they have to work. Uh, so being asked to work unsafely on a non-union site is not unlikely. It's actually something that happens way more often than anyone should be comfortable with. Not, not, there's not room for one, one, one death. And, and Shai, I'm, I'm just saying, and you know, I mean, there was an incident, you know, in the, in the theaters, it was a veteran. I'm just saying that you can't, everyone, safety first. I tell, even our staff here, facility staff, I always, tripping hazards, it becomes a way of life. Everything it could be something, you know, small or somebody cheats a move or something. Yes, you're absolutely right about, yes, labor exploitation. Um, this is from Maureen O'Neill and, um, are many of the archives you mentioned available digitally? Well, I think this is really your, up your street, uh, this question, uh, Rachel. I'm sure you could answer that comprehensively. Uh, well, uh, more and more. <coughs> when we uh, collected the photos for the book, mostly uh, we did all the research in person and none of them were digitized. And increasingly they are available. Um, the Library of Congress has a huge digital portion of its collection digitized. The Wagner Archives is making major strides toward digitization. The ILGW Archives as well. Um, it's uh, you know it's it's a for, it's a important question for libraries and archives about whether the main place we live is online or in person. Um, and so the limit resources are limited. And the first priority is to preserve, to collect and preserve the records. And so digitization happens. Um, and the thing about it is it's easy to do a quick and dirty digitization, uh, but that doesn't mean it'll last for a hundred years. Um, a photograph will last for a hundred years. So, uh, a lot of people say, why don't you just scan them all and be done with it? Um, and it's it's not that simple. And the same thing goes for audio recordings, for oral histories. Uh, it's uh, So yes, a lot of it is digitized. Yes, there's a lot more to be done and it's uh, more complicated uh, than, you would, than you would guess. Um, I think the other thing to say along those lines is that we need to keep collecting. We need to keep interviewing the next generation and locating and 
finding the records, and many of them now are going to be digital, of organizations that aren't always unions these days, but other kinds of organizations that are helping working people um, gather together and fight for the protections and the safety and the job, fair treatment on the job that everybody needs. So it, it's even harder to collect records from an organization that's only digital, if you think about it. Um, if you have an organization of young immigrant advocates who do almost everything on social media, how are you going to collect? How are you going to know what to collect? Um, so that presents its own challenges. And, and archives are stepping up. They have their digital librarians and archivists whose specialty is how do we preserve the modern communication. And that's where we will find the culture of solidarity, at least some of it um, in the records for this century is online. So good question and complicated answer. Yes, yes, ab 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 absolutely. And I, I realized that I had underestimated all that was involved and you just made it clear. And of course, you're absolutely right. Who knows what the long-term history of um, digital records is going to be when new technology keeps coming up. So yes, yeah, so nothing beats a photograph, certainly at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, um, it was so interesting finding out about um, the extensive research that was involved in collaboration with all these other organizations uh, when the book uh, was uh, first, first published. Um, as regards the, um, the next book, the 21st book that will be involving people like Shy and other things, what other ideas do you have in mind to pursue? And will it be produced in 10 years? Will we, look, will we be looking at it in 2030 <laughs> or earlier? Well, I'm not going to commit to a timeline, but I am happy to share that um, uh, Shannon O'Neill and Mike Consowitz at the Wagner Labor Archives at NYU are interested in, so it's two questions. One, when can there be a book? But the more fundamental question is, how are we going to keep on collecting and documenting um, the photos and the oral histories and the stories of workers in the 20th century? And I'm happy to say that um, just as the book in both its editions um, is done in partnership with the Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives, um, so the next stage will also be done in partnership with them. Uh, what are my ideas for that? Uh, do you know, I think it's helped me a lot to go through this book and think about, okay, how do I find a young person who would be able to comment on this photograph? So for instance, the baseball player on Randall's Island, I asked a lot of people, what would be 2020? Uh, young person's activity be? And I'd love to hear if Shai has a suggestion um, or anybody in the audience. Uh, well, one suggestion was a soccer game in Queens um, with, with immigrants. Uh, the question of what do, if people who came in 1950 and got work as garment workers, what do immigrants today get? What kind of work are they doing? We know they're doing driving for Uber and Lyft. They're doing precarious gig economy jobs um, in significant part in delivering, um, delivering food. Um, they're also still in the restaurant industry and the restaurant industry is still struggling to organize. Um, but I think turning it around and, and saying, and looking, looking at the comparison between the 20th and the 21st century is really, can be really revealing. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely fascinating. Is there anything you'd like to add, Shai? What, what do you envision perhaps being included? Oh, and by the way, our audience, if you want to quickly shoot, shoot in a couple of um, ideas that you have, they would be very welcome and uh, we can uh, look at them as well. But Shai, what would you think might be also uh, included in the next edition of the book? 
I, I wish I had an answer for that. I have to truthfully say I don't. Um, my biggest thing right now is make sure, making sure that we take those industries like the restaurant industry, like the car wash industry where workers are being exploited and make sure that we turn those around and make those union careers uh, and that we stop that exploitation. So as much as I do wish that I had a suggestion, um, I have a primary focus right now to just change the now. Yeah, uh, well, a, 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 a very good answer. Um, this is from Barbara. Um, oh, here is a question. Oh, stickball in the summer. This is from Elena Garantino. Stickball in the summer, hot streets, sandlot football. So here's her suggestion of some of the uh, <laughs> recreation act activities. Um, and Barbara Lavar, um, how do you find people with diverse experiences in the trades to include in your project? Uh, very good question. Um, outreach, uh, actually, for for the for this project, we're reaching out to a variety of immigrant rights organizations um, who are. Uh, there's this really important um, paper, uh, analysis, honestly, of why the vote on the Amazon union um, was lost. And one of the reasons posited is that the, the organizers doing the organizing were really looking at those workers at the workplace, but not in all the other places that they are. Um, the same person who's a worker at Amazon also belongs to a church, also belongs to a mother's group, also um, has children in the school. Uh, you know, they're not separate spheres. They're all, they're all overlapping in one person. Um, Shai, I'm sure, can uh, ex experiences that all the time. So I think one of my main uh, thoughts about how to do this is to be sure that we go beyond the workplace in terms of looking for ways to reach out to working people. Um, Shai, what are some of the measures that you take in terms of your advocacy for, let's say, in the car wash and the construction? What are, what are some of the measures in terms of addressing the exploitation? I'm a, uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, rallies in true union fashion. Um, I always, I think that uh, it's still a great practice to show up with a big rat and um, get everyone's attention that way. And uh, just, you know, bring awareness to the community because that's who needs to know about what's happening to the work, to the people that live in their community. As Rachel pointed out, these are churchgoers. These are people involved in mother's groups. Um, so I think it's important. I think a lot of the times it's just, you know, you don't know what's happening to people. If that's not your experience and that's not something that you would be subjected to, you wouldn't be aware. So just bringing awareness, uh, a any way that that needs to happen, I'll get a microphone, a bullhorn, a rat, whatever it takes, um, and show up straight at that site or with or or uh, in front of even the uh, the corporation itself. Is there a follow up with elected officials? Like, what's the next step? And what what's after after the after the rally and and the, and the public, you know, uh, attention? Are you interfacing with elected officials to advance the cause? Absolutely. Yeah, that's something that we've been doing uh, since I've been involved. So that that's a major part. Um, it, it's, it's, of course, a critical part. Um, and it's always, it's always, always, always a follow up. Uh, but for me, because that's not my lane, and I try to stay in my lane, I show up with the, with that rat and that bullhorn, but definitely uh, getting the elected <laughs> officials involved. And do you feel with the coming administration that we will have more success? I don't know if you felt a lot of support as a rule you know, from from the city, let's say of, of New York, who would enforce some of these worker laws, and there has been some progress, whether or not it's enforced on a drop job site or the the, the OSHA site safety, like that was expanded. But again, it's all about that enforcement and someone keeping an eye. So, uh, do you, are you um, optimistic about the you know because it's it helps to have the you know. Yeah. Right. Support. Yeah, in my uh, in my very new position, um, I've had some very interesting phone calls and meetings and emails uh, with the um, the office of um, 
the Office of um, Reentry, uh, which I didn't even know existed until this year. <laughs> um, so that was great to know. And I'm very optimistic about where it's going. Uh, there was a segment on New York One uh, the other day with, um, with uh, Eric Adams, um, who is very, very, very uh, interested in making sure that um, there are these opportunities. We have been in contact with them uh, and we are doing our best uh, with the manpower that we have to make sure that we can continue to address these issues. Thank you. I'm just going to quickly just read out a few of uh, the comments because it's, um, and then we will, um, conclude the lecture, but this is sort of it. Um, Peter King, thank you for including dock workers. My father's first job when he first came to, was to unload crates at South Sea Seaport before he mm -hmm. began working with the Transit Authority. Uh, Ellen Elena Gariano recommends, you, you, this was inspired by the talk about the uh, you know department stores, um, and talk about the separation of lower class New Yorkers. Um, and she recommends, um, a book by E.J. White, You Talking to Me, and she suggests it'd be wonderful to pair this audio book with archival mm -hmm. tutorials. Are you familiar with it, Rachel? Uh, no, but I know White, and I'm sure it, it's a great idea. I will check it out. <laughs> right, and uh, Amanita Gai, um, she, she reflects that the statement by Loretta Salega, the cafeteria worker, was so reminiscent of why the Me Too movement happened recently. And uh, she also wondered what protections are being offered to women laborers, especially immigrant uh, women. So that's, uh, that, that's probably a, a, um, a, a very large question to be, to be able to answer. But is there something you want to say um, in short about that? Either you, Rachel or Shai? Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm enormously moved by the Me Too movement, and I'm also driven to caution people all the time that there have been so many times in our history when we think that if we just expose a wrong, it will be righted. And sadly, that is not the way our history has played itself out. Um, that was true a hundred years ago about different elements of the way workers and women have been treated. And so I, uh, I, I'm just worried that exposure isn't enough and that what we need are um, changes in, in the law and changes in the way, um, in the way, um, things are prosecuted in the way victims are treated when they report crimes. Um, and then there's also a whole set of changes that need to happen, which I'm sure Shai is familiar with in terms of education um, for apprentices and job training. And before you start a job, some kind of education about what's acceptable and what's not needs to happen. And it needs to happen in such a way that it can't be dismissed. Um, it's easy to make it rote. Uh, and same is true with safety, right? People learn it, but learning it and doing it are two different things. And I think that um, it, it's just so important to go beyond the question of exposure and talk about what can we in, in every situation do to prevent the, this from happening again. But Shai, did you want to add to that? I do. I'm actually really excited uh, that that question was asked. Um, and though I don't have the magical answer to, you know, bring it all to an end, um, I ju I'm just extremely proud of my local. Um, last year, there was um, there was a woman uh, that came that came to us from a non-union local, um, and she she came to our district council and she discussed with us uh, some sexual harassment that was occurring in a in a at a non-union job. Um, it was major. It was it was it was absolutely disgusting. And um, our district council jumped right on it. Uh, they provided so much assistance to her and the other women that were involved. Uh, we were able to help them actually get a lawsuit for 1.8 million uh, between, I believe, I think 16 women um, and put that, um, that company out of business. Uh, we then went ahead and we uh, took her on as an employee with our local. And she is now uh, the, one of the first uh, female, black female organizers uh, with our local. 
Um, so I'm just really proud of the work that we've been doing. Um, in addition, we, um, we, uh, we're working with a with Diana Florence. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with her. She was running for uh, DA of Manhattan. Uh, she was just all over sexual harassment in this industry. Um, so we did a lot of work with her. Um, and then it, as far as our, our um, organization is concerned, Pathways to Apprenticeship, just today, uh, one of our classes, which is one of our wrap-up classes, we work with an organization called Working Theater. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization uh, where they specialize in uh, doing plays about real life, um, specifically in the union, uh, union construction industry, uh, and it was on sexual harassment. We do this play for each class. Um, I started the class this morning with having them do a journal entry about sexual harassment and what it meant to them. Um, and out of 25 people, it was, uh, you know, it was upsetting to understand how many people just don't know what sexual harassment is. Um, and by the end of the class, it was just, you know, a miracle. It was, it was great to see how tuned in everyone was and how uh, that's how you change the culture. When you take a class of people of men and women um, and you explain you know, what sexual harassment is and how you can be a part of, uh, of dismantling it. Uh, and that's, that's really important to us at Pathways to Apprenticeship. Uh, thank, thank you both for your fulsome answers and very, very, uh, very thoughtful answers on, 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 that, on that topic. Um, it seemed to me like this, um, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives, the book, A Pictorial History of Working People in New York City. Um, there was, and, and there's Victoria showing this wonderful book, but all the things that it encompasses, because we've just begun, we're, we're at the tip of the iceberg, aren't we, when we're looking at some of these topics that have, that have come up tonight. And it's such a wonderful um, and, and, and important book. Um, to use that expression that uh, you use, the, you know, the culture of solidarity. I think that's a wonderful way of describing it. And we are so grateful for you, Rachel and Shai, for bringing your, your wisdom and your thoughtful perspective tonight. It really was a wonderful presentation and we are delighted that you can be here this evening. Um, uh, Victoria, would you like to say something? Just in listening to Rachel and to Shy, and, and um, that all great movements are a movement of the people, and that not only in terms of what they produce on a daily basis, but that it shows the importance once more of remaining engaged. For anything to occur, it has to be constant, all great, I mean, the labor movement itself, it wasn't by people who didn't want to come to meetings or who looked at their phones and got distracted. And I'm just being very frank, the ac great accomplishments are made with extreme focus and a will, steel will. And the good thing about the construction industry, there's a lot of that going around. It's an industry I adore. And, and love and, and, we, and we, of course, support at every level. And here's to good things to come because we, if there's one industry that affects everyone's lives, it's plumbing, heating, mechanical, concrete, your buildings, every, it touches every aspect of your life. So, so ladies, to the best, Rachel, to your new book, shy to your new endeavor as the executive director of Pathways to Apprenticeship and to good things to come for our great city. And God bless and thank you to our, well, everyone who joined us tonight. Yes. Thank you to second, to, to second that. I just want to remind you that you can purchase this really wonderful book by going to www.nyu press.org and as you can see on the slide that we're looking at the moment there you'll find more of these photos and these really absolutely wonderful uh, oral histories and music at laborarts.org um, i'm just going to quickly mention that our final lecture of the season is hidden in plain sight the cast stone of the Juan Y building um, in Guaguanas, brooklyn again Thank you, the audience, for joining us. Thank you so much. And I want to thank our wonderful speakers, Rachel and Shai. Thank you. And thank you.
and of course Angelo behind the scenes. Um, if so I, if I, I'm sorry if I could just steal the last 10 seconds I just want to let you guys know I put the website up for our organization if anyone is interested or would like to refer anyone or just interested in learning more about our organization I have included that in the chat uh, and that is www.p2atrades.org. Oh, that's great. And you know what? Thank you, Shai. I should have put that on the slide. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And we will send it out when we send out a recording um, of the lecture. We, we will be sure to add that. So thank you. And uh, thank you again, Rachel and Shai. Um, so and thank you night. for having us. And thank you, Shai. Yes. Um, Our Victoria pleasure. and Karen, really terrific. And well, to the audience, please be in touch and help us work on the next Ordinary People Extraordinary Lives project. Absolutely. Thank okay. you so much. Good night. Thanks. Thank you.